Uh, good morning. Welcome to the second day of the <coughs> SPIN 2016 Symposium. We start uh, our program with uh, an invited talk, and it is my privilege to uh, introduce our speaker, Pierre Roper. Pierre is uh, one of uh, the best uh, researchers in the field of uh, formal methods and in particular model checking. He has been uh, shaping and setting trends in the field in the uh, last more than at least 35 years, so it all probably you will not tell it by his youthful appearance. He is a professor at the University of Liège, and before that he has been at uh, Bell Labs in the uh, no, well-known uh, uh, facilities in Murray Hill, New Jersey, where uh, Unix and C have been created, but also Spin. Um, for his uh, work, uh, he has uh, uh, received many recognitions and awards. Uh, he is a member of uh, Academia Europea, also of the uh, Royal Academy of Belgium. And uh, he's a recipient of the 2000 Gödel Prize, uh, which is uh, given for uh, the best paper in theoretical computer science. It's one of the most prominent awards in theoretical computer science. Also in 2005, he received the Paris uh, Canelakis Theory and Practice Award, uh, which is given for, uh, again, contributions, which uh, theoretical contributions which have had the significant impact in practice. Uh, also in the verification field, he has received uh, many outstanding re rewards, like in 2014 he received the CAV award for his contributions to the uh, partial reduction technique, that's the technique uh, for uh, uh, reducing the state space in uh, explicit uh, model checking, one of the most effective techniques. He's one of the uh, inventors. And uh, also in 2006 and 2011, he received uh, the Lix Logic in Computer Science uh, Conference Awards for Test of Time. Uh, the award, this is a award given for papers who have uh, 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 passed this test of time, papers who uh, really inspire generations of uh, uh, researchers. Uh, so these are the official uh, recognitions uh, that he has received, but also unofficially when you talk with peers and colleagues, uh, you hear many arguments of him, and yesterday actually happened something that I want to tell you. So the, uh, at the dinner somebody uh, told me actually that he said, I was attracted to the field of formal methods by uh, the paper Temporal Logic Can Be More Expressive by Pierre Volpaire. So I think this is one of the best compliments that uh, you can get. I think I have a couple of more anecdotes of uh, that uh, style, but uh, I think I should stop here and give the floor to Pierre. When Dragon, thank you very much for this you know, very, very nice introduction. And after such an introduction, now I have a big challenge of, of giving a, a talk. Um, so, but actually, you know, I, I start my talk with a few warnings, so, so you won't be disappointed when, when I'm going on. And what are the warnings? Well, my talk is going to be a dinosaur talk. <laughs> and you might wonder why. And this is a small anecdote also, you know, a couple of years ago I was talking to, to one of my uh, last graduate students and, and uh, talking about things that, you know, did happen some time ago and, and see the people I knew and things uh, that I'd worked on and so on. And he looked at me and said, well, yes, he said, you are really a dinosaur of the field. So I think he meant it really nicely, you know, as far as a compliment, but I thought it was a, you know, good... Uh, maybe description of the situation, and as you mentioned, I've been working on this for quite a few years. So it's the perspective of a dinosaur on the field we should be hearing today. Um, I have to also apologize for the fact that I'm not going to talk about everything or about everybody. So, you know, of course, I'm focusing on some topics and, and we'll mention some people. And of course, a lot of other people have contributed to the field and there's been a lot of other work which is not going to be mentioned, mentioned here. 
I'm not going to try and give a very technically detailed talk, but rather emphasize ideas and how the field has evolved and I hope will evolve. Because this has been going on for a long time and I think you know, some of our challenges is what is going to happen you know, in the next 10 or 20 years uh, in verification. So I premised the dinosaur talk, so this is what it's about. Right. Taming Bugorus rex. Okay. So it's something I made up, but anyway, we are going to start going back a long way in history. So to make it sound a bit more prehistoric, I decided to say, well, let's look at what happened 40 billion nano years ago. Of course, as you can figure out, this is 40 years ago. And, but when I think about it, another year is actually you know, not such a, a short amount of time, because it's about 30 uh, milliseconds. And for computers, 30 milliseconds is a long time. So 40 billion years ago, well, I wasn't, you know, that was, would be uh, 76, but I was still in, in uh, you know, doing my engineering degree, so I wasn't really active in the area yet. But uh, the field was pretty simple. You know, it's a period where you could you know, read 10 papers and, and know what needed to be known about the, the topic of verification. And uh, well, verification was uh, about logic, assertions. You know, we had all this work on, on the you know, annotating program with invariance and inductive assertions and, and proving that these were preserved when you, you know, were executing the program and going through uh, instructions and loops. And this is basically the only uh, game in town. And so here are some of the people who, you know, were the founders of the field, Bob Floyd, uh, Tony Ho, and Edward Dextra, who is actually a local dinosaur because he, you know, worked in, in the TV, I think, in the late 70s and early 80s. So, <clears throat> if I put the names in, in, in this colors because I thought, well, we, know, I don't know what the, we don't know what the color of dinosaurs were, but you know, this probably is quite suitable. Um, so this was all about sequential programs. And then, you know, the field started moving towards concurrent programs. And uh, concurrent programs you know, were a challenge because you know, the methods developed for sequential programs did not you know, port very easily to concurrent programs, since they were based on composing you know, what was known about parts of the programs and then putting these things together. But for sequential programs, it worked fairly nicely, because if you knew what one part did and you had an assertion about the end of the part, that was an assertion about the, the rest of the part of the program. Now, when you do things concurrently, the programs continuously interact. So it's, it's much harder to have an assertion about you know, a, a process and another process and combine these to know what the both are going to do together. Anyway, there was work on the topic and, and uh, for instance, was the work of uh, Susan Lewicki with her advisor David Grease, you know, who actually started you know, uh, the movement towards verifying concurrent programs. And then something, you know, difference happens and, and a different look uh, uh, view of things was introduced and I think as you all know you've all heard about Amir Pnueli who introduced temporal logic in 77 got a, a Turing award for this and uh, this was really a, a change of paradigm because now rather than working with classical first order logic and looking at the assertions about basically states of the program we were working, or today started working with temporal logic, which talked about not just one state, but the whole sequence of states the program could go through. So <clears throat> this was a, an interesting you know, change in perspective and uh, you know, started quite a few things. Now, when you talk about you know, sequential programs, you have you know, partial correctness, which means the program you know, ends in the state which is compatible with what you require, and also termination, which is it does terminate. And of course, for ongoing programs or concurrent programs, it doesn't quite work this way. So these were generalized to safety and liveness, and, and I, I cite Lampert as one of the people who contributed to this effort. So at the time, you know, you started reading 10 papers and you knew everything going on, and uh, then what happened? 
Well, if you look at what happens in the situation a decade later, that would be, you know, our 30 billion uh, nano years ago, so about in 1986. Well, a lot of things have had happened at this point. Uh, <clears throat> first thing, since this is the spin workshop, spin had already started. So, well, these are, were the years where I was uh, at Bell Labs and Gerard was also there, and Gerard was working on spin, and, and uh, actually the first versions of spin came out, and it was really, really, you know, something quite interesting to have this program which could efficiently analyze, you know, finite state spaces of concurrent programs. Second move which happened at the same time was, or a little bit earlier even, was that the emphasis before in verification was on first order logics and there was a move to proposition logics. The people started realizing that you could do interesting things with proposition logics. You did not need, you know, first order logic to do something meaningful with programs. And actually, this was part of, you know, what I did in my thesis, where I was synthesizing programs from proposition temporal logic specifications. And there was also uh, <clears throat> Anna Leveson doing similar things with his advisor Ed Clark. My advisor was Zora Mana who was also synthesizing, doing something similar. I was working with linear time and, and Alan was working with branching time. And then there was another you know, related idea that came out, which was the famous model checking idea. Meaning that if you had the program, a finite state program, this could be interpreted as a model for a temporal logic formula, and you could check whether indeed you know, this model satisfied the temporal logic formula. So, this really, I think, is important because it completely changed the field of verification from, you know, working with, you know, first order logics to working with proposition logics. Interestingly, other things were going on with proposition logics at the time. And, for instance, there was this thing called dynamic logic. And what dynamic logic was is, you know, a form of whole logic, assertions about programs, but done in the proposition framework. So programs were basically regular expressions, and you had, you know, uh, assertions with your propositions, and then you studied the logic of, you know, what happens after executing a program to a proposition. Did it was it true or false? And you could have a complete proof system and decision procedure for these dynamic logics. Other interesting things going on was process algebra, and process algebra was presented as a a framework to reason about concurrent programs and the theory of concurrent programs. But really, what it did is, you know, take a different view of when are transition systems equivalent and how do you reason about transition systems when they are intended to be composed as concurrent processes. Because when you look at transition systems, if you go back to traditional automata theory, you say, well, you know, they are equivalent if they accept the same language. But of course, when you're composing them, this is not true anymore. So you needed something more, and the extra idea that was you know, introduced were things like you know, by simulation, uh, due to Robin Milder, and algorithms for checking this were also developed, and I'm citing Kanelakis and, and, and Smolker, who you know, gave the first efficient algorithms for checking things like by simulation. And of course, I uh, have to mention also the automata theoretic approach which is, you know, something I developed with, with Moshe Vardy in the 80s. And the idea there was that, indeed, you could go from logic to transition system. This was the, you know, synthesis work. But transition systems, if you're looking at, you know, infinite behaviors, you have to add some, you know, <coughs> acceptance conditions to them. And this was the idea of automaton infinite words. And so you could say, well, I can go from, you know, the logic to the automaton, expressing the behaviors which are described by the logic formula. And then if you want to do verification model checking, you can combine the program, which is a transition system, with the automaton, which is also a transition system. And this really changed things because what happened is that now, doing verification was purely, almost purely, reasoning about transition systems and reachability. For safety properties, it is just reachability. 
And for Leibniz properties, you need repeated reachability, which is a little bit more. I mean, can you reach the state and reach the state from itself again? And this is what is done in tools like SPIN, where you know, this idea was exploited in order to really focus on the algorithmic aspects of doing reachability and make this efficient, and forget a little bit about the logic. It was also an interesting time, you know, and, and with a lot of excitement. Uh, <clears throat> and why was the field, you know, really, you know, evolving so fast at the time and, and, and attracting attention? Um, <clears throat> because, you know, first the focus was now on things where verification was felt to be needed. You know, people were writing concurrent algorithms and writing them with bugs. And, and uh, you know, even things were published with bugs because we did not know how to really reason very effectively. Well, there were some proofs, manual proofs, but we had now tools to reason about these, you know, so often very short but tr quite tricky algorithms. And so also verification had become algorithmic. The spin is an algorithm, you just run the, the, the tool on the, the program and you find bugs, which is quite different from doing a manual proof. There was also this excitement about, you know, having a unifying uh, theme for doing the verification, which was finite state transition systems and, and you know, a lot of variants of finite automata. I mentioned, you know, automata on, on words, on infinite words, but it was also automaton trees, all sorts of, of automata. And this was a, a very powerful unifying theme at the point. Well, it was also, you know, since we are in research in the academic world, there are lots of possibilities for developing theories and dealing with complexity results. You know, you could say, well, is this problem in P, or is it in P, P space, exponential time, or even non-elementary, that means not bounded by a finite number of exponentials. So, lots of excitement about, you know, proving this type of results. And also, that, you know, there was lots of possibilities for doing things more practical and improving the tools, you know, that means dealing with the input languages for your verification tools, dealing with the algorithms, getting better implementations, and so making things progress in this way. It was also a nice time because we had strong debates. And the type of debates we had were about, for instance, branching time versus linear time. So, I uh, don't know if this is genuine or not, but there we have a branching time dinosaur, and there we have a linear time dinosaur. So, what was the fight about? Well, branching time logics, temporal logics, talk about, you know, trees or, or graphs and can talk about various behaviors in, this, uh, in these trees, whereas linear time logics talk about, you know, sequences and they talk about properties of sets of sequences. So, the big debate was about complexity. And if you look at complexity, you take a program P, represented as a transition system. And you take a, a formula F and you say, well, does P satisfy F? Now, the big, uh, you know, boost for model checking was to say, well, this can be done in time which is linear in the size of the program and linear in the size of the formula. Now, for linear time logic, things were not quite as nice because you still were linear in the size of the program, but in the size of the formula, you had an exponential. And that's because going from the formula to the automaton is a possibly exponential procedure, exponential in the worst case. Now, if you look at more powerful branching time logics like CTL star, which actually combines you know, linear time and the branching quantifiers of CTL, you get still the same complexity. So going to, from linear time to the full branching time does not increase the complexity. But when, when you look at complexity results, you say, well, are they really meaningful? Are they really interesting? And there's, there's lots of questions you can ask about this, and more and more people are questioning, you know, our usual classification of complexity. At the time, say, people say, well, P is good, you know, uh, anything above P and P, P space or whatever, is, you know, not tractable, not going to be uh, feasible. But so this was a strong argument to say this is perfectly feasible. But you have to be very careful about what it means. But what is size of P? Size of P is size of the program as a transition system. 
Now, if you're looking at a concurrent program, to obtain the transition system, you have to you know, combine the processes. And this can be exponential. Now, if you look at, say, well, this is much better than this, well, you have to remember that the formula is usually right, quite small. Often, you know, it can be separated into small assertions that can be checked independently. And if you look at the automaton constructed for the formulas, you know, we are used to uh, checking when doing verification, this is not a problem. So even though there was a big debate about these complexity issues, my conclusion now is that you know, we don't really care about this. It's not really a meaningful difference. There are other you know, problems. And the other problem was really you know, hitting the real exponential wall. Because we had a very nice framework for checking finite state programs. Good algorithms. Okay. But then we were still faced with a, a double challenge. Okay. And the challenge is that the program model is exponential, of course, in the size of the data. If you have n bits, you have two to the n possible states. And also in the size of the concurrent control. If you have n processes, well, then the number of states is the uh, <coughs> products of the size of the different controls of the various processes, so it grows exponentially with the number of processes. If a process is of size, say, p, it's p to the n to get the concurrent control. So this was really the situation. We had a nice, nice techniques, but we had you know, this real problem about you know, this exponential size of the program. So a number of things were introduced to solve this. And you know, among these, I'm citing, a, a, I think what I think are probably those that you know, were the most used, partial order methods. I'll go back to this in a few minutes. Abstraction, symmetry, dealing with identical processes, saying, well, if I have a system which is composed of n identical processes, then I can clearly simplify reasoning about these processes and uh, <clears throat> do some, find some methods which you know, can either reduce this uh, very large system from one composing, uh, containing a limited number of processes, or you know, find some induction to, to go from, you know, n processes to n plus one and hence uh, solve the problem once and for all, so, uh, reasoning only with a limited number of processes. And then there was another big uh, uh, introduction, which was symbolic methods, and I'll also get back to that. So this brings us a decade later to see what's happened with all, with dealing with this challenge. So now we are 20 billion nano years ago and we are fighting exponentials. It's no longer dinosaurs, but you know, there's nobody to fight dinosaurs, so I had to find something different. So what was the excitement about partial order methods? Well, the idea is, is extremely simple. If you look at you know, concurrent processes and you combine them, what well, the usual semantics use is interleaving semantics. So you start in a state and you say, well, process one can move or process two can move and I start interleaving these moves of the various processes. Now, what happens is that you know, not all these interleavings are interesting and worth considering because a lot of them are equivalent. Equivalent meaning what? That you know, if you have processes moving independently, whether I do A in process one or B in process two, one way or the other does not matter, will not change the state I reach. And so we can do things and do a search through the state space, which is the usual technique being used in all this, which is selective and says, well, I'm only going to choose some of the transitions. So I'm in a state, I say, well, I have you know, various possibilities of processes moving, well, I do not need to consider the move of all the processes if there's some independence between the actions that, you know, can be taken. Of course, the difficulty there is not to see after you've expanded the state space that you could get rid of some things, but it is to do it on the fly as you are generating the state space and see that, indeed, there are some transitions that you can drop. Now, <clears throat> 
this type of, of selective search was proposed by, by various people and you know, uh, it is based on indeed this idea of detecting which transitions are independent with sufficient criteria for doing this and then you know, having methods for constructing sufficient sets of transitions to consider when we are doing the uh, state-space search. And this can have a very radical effect on the size of the state space. So, in some ways, it's dealing with the, the first challenge, you know, the first exponential challenge, which is that the size of the state space is exponential in the size of the control. And the methods proposed were, well, stubborn sets by Antti uh, Valmari, where I worked with Patrice Godefroy. Um, on persistent sets and, and sleep sets, and uh, Doron Pellet also worked on the topic, uh, introduced a, a variant of these which were ample sets, and this was implemented in SPIN by uh, Doron and, and, of course, uh, Gérard. And actually, uh, and you mentioned the award, you know, the, the CAV award, which was actually shared with, with these people, Antti, Doron, and, and Patrice. So, Maybe this part of the solution, we have coped with the, in the explosion of uh, the state space due to concurrency, but of course this is not enough. The other approach which was developed at the time was symbolic methods. And uh, symbolic methods were based on the idea that if you're dealing with states, well, there are too many of them, so deal with formulas representing sets of states. And, well, we're still in the finite state context because we're assuming that states can be coded by a finite number of Boolean variables, and you can write Boolean formulas to represent states or sets of states and the transition relation. Of course, states are then bit vectors, and the transition relation is simply a Boolean function on pairs of vectors. So do you double the size of the vector, you have state one, state two, and you have a Boolean formula that says, well, can I move from state one to state two? Now, the nice thing is that you can compute with these Boolean formulas, and the whole trick was finding the right coding for the Boolean formulas, which could make the computation sufficiently efficient. And this was done, you know, uh, for instance, with the introduction of ordered binary decision diagrams, and I'm citing Brand, uh, Randy Brandt here, and then, you know, once you had these ideas, you could say, well, to do, for instance, model checking, I could do, you know, the f necessary fixed point computations to do, the, to do the checking by using these OBDDs. Well, if you want to think about the fixed point computations, just think about reachability. And you say, well, I'm trying to build the reachable states, so I start with the initial states, and then I say, well, what can I reach with doing the transition once? You know, twice and so on, and when you reach a fixed point, you have the reachable states. And of course, this generalizes also to temporal properties, and this was, you know, the success of the method. So, of course, there you could say, well, you know, I could deal with huge number of states, because I had formulas, if I have n bits, I was dealing with systems with two to the n states symbolically, and this was quite nice. Now, abstraction was, of course, also one of the big ideas. We said, well, if you can't deal you know, with the data, abstract from the data. That's the second cause. And so what does it mean, abstract from the data? Well, simplify it. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> now there was some, some foundational work, and you know, people often cite Cousin Cousin on the, the topic, which is to you know, say, well, I have an abstract domain, a concrete domain, I have relations between the two, what can I prove in the concrete domain from the abstract domain? So this is a, you know, rather large field, a lot of work has been done on the topic and, and quite, quite interesting, sometimes quite, you know, insightful from a more theoretical point of view. And, you know, indeed, abstraction techniques are widely used. And, of course, the whole issue is when you're dealing with an abstract model is what can you say about the concrete model about the program that's actually been, been run. Actually, since this is the SPIN workshop, I'm going to mention some form of abstraction which is present in SPIN, which is bit state. Now, the idea there is quite simple. It's not really an abstraction but it's storing states as signatures. 
So you all know the idea of a signature. When, when you download the file, you, you have this hash code computed from the file, which is a signature, and you check you know, the one which is on the server compared to the one you compute from your downloaded file to check there's no error. So a huge amount of data, and if you have large states, a state, the state coding of a state can be quite large, can be abstracted to a signature which lets you distinguish between different states. And so that was the idea of, of bit state. And in bit state, what happens is that you don't store the signature. You use the signature as an address in the bit table. So you compute from the state an address, and then if you, you have a bit table, and you turn the bit on at the corresponding address when you visit the state. And so if when you visit a new state, you look, if, is it in the table? If it is in the table, if the bit is on at the corresponding position, then uh, you decide that, well, I've seen the state. I don't know to, need to go back to it again. So this is what was implemented originally by Bajar in SPIN. And actually, we had a nice debate about this because I, I analyzed the method with, with Danilo Huawei, which was one of my students at the time. And we said, well, OK, we can do better than this because you, the signatures which correspond to the address are really a little bit too small. And so, indeed, you are going to miss states. So the idea is use larger signatures and store them explicitly. And then, you know, you can have uh, almost certainty with a high probability that you're not going to miss any states. And I think these are two, uh, after discussing this quite widely, you know, with, with, with Jair, we realize these are two complementary approaches. And basically, the issue is, you know, what do you want as far as coverage? With bit states, what's going to happen is that you, you're going to probably cover more states, but you don't know exactly what you've missed or if you've missed something. With other method, which we call hash compact, and actually is also available in SPIN now, then you know that you're not going to do mistakes, but you are going to be limited by the amount of memory in your machine with respect to the number of states you can visit. So, complementary approaches, interesting, you know, debates, but also, you know, something which comes from, you know, this idea of abstracting and making things simpler in the model to be analyzed. Well, all this was quite good, you know, so we were progressing very much in the verification of finite state systems, but then finite is not enough. Can everything be reduced to finite uh, state spaces? Well, no. I mean, some systems, if you try to reduce them to something which is finite state, you lose too much information and you abstract, for instance, the data, but you lose so much information that the system does not you know, become meaningful anymore, and what you can check is not going to tell you enough about the actual uh, system that you want to analyze. A simple case of this is, for instance, even if you take you know, programs, uh, rec take recursive programs, and you want to, to check properties, even they're just sequential, so I abstract from the data, and for instance, what has been done there is abstracting the data to, to Boolean data, so you have only bits as, as data. So this is, you know, if you have a finite number of them, it's finite state. But the control of recursive programs is not finite state, because you can have a stack. Right? If you don't know how deep your recursive calls are going to go, then to model this, you need to reason about systems with stacks. Also, even if your system could possibly be reduced to finite state systems, you know, viewing them as infinite states can sometimes be a useful abstraction and actually make things simpler. Because <clears throat> imagine that you are dealing with, with numbers, natural numbers or integers, and you say, well, I'm going to limit my, uh, the size of my numbers to a given number of bits, right? So this should make things finite state. But reasoning about you know, integers of limited size can be harder than reasoning about unbounded integers, because you have to take into account these bounds. So you're saying 
representing all integers or all integers less than the given bound is not the same thing. And having the bound is going to be a, a usually a handicap. So may as well go to the infinite state system. And this was an idea which was also you know, very fruitfully introduced in the study of the, and models of time systems and hybrid systems. I mean, time systems, you could say, well, we could make half time discrete and then look at you know, discrete trajectories and, and sort of reduce all this to the finite state framework. But then, you know, that you say, well, let's look at continuous time. And of course, if you're dealing with continuous variables, things are different. But this has proven to be a very good model of time systems and one for which you can develop, indeed, effective you know, analysis, analysis uh, methods and, and check you know, quite effectively. And of course, from time systems, people move to, to hybrid systems where you have you know, not just time going by, but you have dynamic components of your systems obeying differential equations and evolving you know, and reasoning about the combination of the discrete control and the dynamical system. So we had this challenge of, of moving you know, beyond finite state systems. And uh, I'm going you know, 10 more years, uh, 10 years further in time. And uh, I'm saying, well, we are there back to logic. And if I say logic you know, incremented, it's because it was a different view of logic. But, you know, first, a little cartoon to introduce logic. You know, and as you, I guess I think it's quite reasonable. So there's a fourth of the proof, okay? And uh, logic is this consistent. And then the person there is writing to Donald Knuth, Knuth about uh, finding errors in the art of computer programming. As you know, the art of computer programming is a series of books written by Donald Knuth, and he promised uh, a check for every person finding bugs in the uh, in these books. And um, well, he did write quite a few, but few of them were, were cached, actually. So people kept them as a souvenir. So he has an outstanding balance, uh, but probably after some years, I guess checks are not considered to be valid anymore. Anyway, so what's, what about logic, you know, incremented? Well, what happened, you know, over the time in my... my Division in, in periods of 10 years is not perfect, of course, because there was some overlap between various developments and the time at which different things happened. But um, I would say that really the development that moved things is that logic with efficient, you know, decision or semi-decision procedures and good tools for these, you know, started to appear and be more and more developed. And of course, the, the most prominent case is SAT. You know, if you look, go back in the old years, SAT was, you know, really the problem that, you know, was NP-complete. And, you know, don't try using SAT. It's NP-complete. We have only have exponential algorithms for this. This is not usable. But then people started using SAT, you know, in AI and other fields and d doing really, you know, interesting things with SAT solvers and being able to build SAT solvers that could cope with very, very large formulas. So, so much for complexity measures, so SATs is no longer such a frightening problem. Okay. And SAT was also imported to, to model checking by saying, well, now rather than doing the symbolic computation with BDDs and so on, we could just code the whole model checking problem as a SAT formula. Of course, this requires bounding the number of variables that appear. And if you look at it, a computation where you have you know, success, succession of states, so each state is coded by a finite number of bits, fine. But if you don't bound the length of the sequences, then the number of bits you need to code the computation grows and grows. So well, the observation was that most bugs appear on computations that are not that deep. So if we bound the length of the computation, we can actually do a lot of interesting things and reduce the problem to SAT. And this is the, the famous uh, you know, bounded model checking approach, which is indeed quite successful. Now, <clears throat> lots of other works on, for instance, satisfiability modular theories, which are you know, basically first order logic in extended with you know, interpreted theories, like, like for instance, uh, relations on, on integers, dealing with linear constraints, 
there are lots of tools for dealing with li linear constraints, and these can be incorporated into you know, systems for deciding formulas and dealing, for instance, with you know, regions of space. This, of course, applies to timed automata or uh, hybrid automata. And also a lot of work, well, this is also a topic which is dear to me, of using automata for representing all sorts of data values. And of course, our natural things like list queues or, or stacks. I mean, for instance, if you're dealing with uh, systems communicating you know, through queues, which is a usual model of uh, um, concurrent systems, then you can say, well, the content of the queues uh, is really a string, and the, the set of possible contents can be represented by a finite automaton. So I can reason with these and compute with these symbolically as I was computing symbolically with you know, BDDs representing Boolean information. Stacks, of course, are used, as I mentioned, when you're dealing with recursive programs. So being able to compute the possible content of a stack when you're doing some operations in the, in the program uh, is also a useful thing. And this can be done with algorithms that actually build an automaton representing the possible contents of stacks. Another thing that you know, we worked with with uh, Bernard Boisleau, which is also one of my former students, is representing numbers by, or sets of numbers by automata. That's a nice idea is that indeed if you take a, a number, you call it in binary, it's a string. So you can represent sets of numbers by an automaton, accepting you know, strings of uh, uh, the alphabet composing of the, the numbers in the base you're uh, <coughs> dealing with. You can also go to vectors because if you have you know, several numbers, you can just read them simultaneously and then you have multi bits you know, at each stage and this then reads a vector. And actually, interestingly, what you can represent you know, with automata uh, <coughs> independently of the base is exactly Presberger arithmetic, arithmetic without multiplication. So it's quite a powerful and interesting tool for dealing with reasoning in this type of interpreted logic. So these tools have been you know, widely applied in a number of, of uh, contexts and, and for dealing with various problems. And this has also contributed to the evolution of the field. So where are we now? Well, <clears throat> I try to you know, extract a few ideas about what, was the, what are the current trends, about, you know, for instance, looking at the programs of our recent conferences, and of course the things you see emerging is there's an emphasis clearly on real languages. You want to verify programs which are not in the model language but the real language, but this often means also going from the real language to a more abstract representation, but trying to do this more or less automatically. There's also this idea of mixing static and dynamic checking. Of course, when you talk about model checking, we're very much in dynamic checking, why dynamic checking? Because we are looking at the executions. Now, of course, when you look at the code of a program, there's lots of analysis you can do just on the code without looking at the execution. Uh, and you know, this has been used, of course, for, for many years in the field of programming languages. And you can also infer quite a lot of interesting information from the static analysis of the code. Of course, abstraction is still a big issue. And of course, now we have larger and larger computers. and uh, you know, you think, well, this is probably going to solve the problem because in other areas of science, you know, the more powerful the computer, the better off you are. And you can start simulating larger and larger systems and getting more and more information. The problem with verification is that as the computer gets larger and your power to analyze things gets better, then the systems you're analyzing also get larger. And of course, the problem there is that if you look at the state space, where well, it grows exponentially with the size of the computer, the number of bits, say, of memory, whatever, but the speed does not grow the same way. So uh, we have, you know, not the same advantage as other scientists have of saying, well, you know, get a new computer and you'll do much more because we have to analyze larger and larger systems. So the question at this stage is, you know, where are we and what is going to be the next magic bullet? really changing the field. We need some inspiration. OK? So there's the magic bullet. It's a nice one. Well, 
if you look at the history of things as I've been doing now for quite a while, you say, well, you know, a lot of things were not invented but imported. But if you look at the, the history of the, many of the things I described, you know, verifying programs with assertions and proofs, well, logic was there, you know, a long time before computers were, were there, the programs. Temporal logic actually had its history in, in logic and philosophy. It was really about developing a logic of time and, and the use of tenses, also talking about the past, the future, you know, and this type of issues. Automata, well, they were introduced, you know, also a long time ago in the context of, yes, reasoning about computation, indeed. If you think about Turing machines, they were a form of automata, and, and those go way back. Of course, also in logic, they were used as a tool for getting decision procedures in logic quite a long time ago. I mean, for instance, the type of automata we've been using in the verification goes back to Buki, which worked in the early 60s on these topics. Okay, well, of course, automata dealing with finite state systems was, was also prominent in the area of, of circuits and, and actual engineering, so this was a model widely used there and probably you know, also inspired some of the early tools that explored state spaces. Well, there are some contributions from programming languages and the, the theory, uh, but also contributions from um, AI and, for instance, for tools for deciding logic and theorem proving which have contributed to the field. Now, this is the situation, but, you know, we've used these things. What is going to be next? So, let's look at what is the current craze, right? And if you, you know, look at what happens in, in uh, you know, computer science and where, where's the most excitement, where you see big data, machine learning, deep learning. It's solving the whole problem. So this, I actually, this picture I took from the Economist, which last week had a, a piece about, you know, artificial intelligence, million-dollar babies. And what are the million-dollar babies? Well, they are people hired from academia to work on AI problems in, you know, companies as those that are described there. So they're being picked from academia and maybe, you know, with the consequence of things uh, not developing so fast in academia anymore because a lot of this work is moving to, to industry. Interesting trend. Means that, you know, these technologies are considered to be, you know, very powerful. Of course, if you look at, at deep learning, what's, what's, it's almost magical because, you know, you have a general approach and you don't need to know much about, you know, the problem itself to, to actually build tools that actually work, you know, quite effectively. So, is this useful for verification? And this is what I'm going to try and, you know, talk about for the last ten minutes of this talk. Well, if you look at verification and if you look at the idea of that what we want to verify is intricate algorithms, even rather small intricate algorithms, like you know, protocols or, or synchronization algorithms or whatever, I would say this is not likely to happen, that deep learning is going to help with this. But I'll give more details about this in a few minutes. Checking code, uh, statistically, indeed this is a possibility. And there's an area called now big code not just big data. A big code is saying, well, there's lots of code around. Can we learn from this? Now, two ideas I've just introduced preparing this talk is modeling the environment. Now, when you know that when you want to verify a system, part of the problem is that your system does not operate in the vacuum, but operates in the environment. So you need to have some idea of what's going to happen in the environment in order to be able to do the analysis. Now, one way to do this is to be very generic about the environment and say it's completely non-deterministic, so you not, don't know what's going to happen, and you check all possibilities. But this is not quite enough, so I get back to that. And another area, possibly 
where you could benefit from learning is monitoring operating software. When I mean operating software, I mean software which is operating. So you are running the software and you're looking at what's going on and maybe you can detect things before things get too badly wrong. So let's take a look at all this in slightly more details. Well, checking intricate algorithms, I think, you know, this is not very likely to succeed. Well, because the, the variety of techniques used in these algorithms is quite wide, and the, the, these ideas are quite different, so it's hard to learn from one and apply this to another. Also, this is not the type of thing that can be checked by just looking at the code. And when you're looking at the synchronization problem, you can't reason about the code, you have to reason about what happens during the code, so it's not directly obvious you need also to have an execution model to analyze the, the, what's going to the behavior of the program and you know this is you know going one step beyond just having looking at you know code and, and analyzing this as, as data also if ourselves you know deep learning tries to, to in some ways to model the way our brain works more, more or less you know, accurately, of course, but this is the, the general idea. And we are not very good at spotting bugs in this type of code. So I would say this is not a very good candidate for learning. Now, checking codes uh, statically, um, that's quite interesting. Actually, there's things being done on this. DARPA launched, uh, launched an initiative called uh, MUSE. And the idea there is, you know, let's look at all the code around and try and do something, learn from it. There's also people in, in, in Zurich, in, uh, among which Martin Vechev, doing similar ideas. We take you know, code bases, we have you know, lots of code lying around, and uh, let's see what we can do for, with this. So if we learn from good code, Hopefully we have good code. We could maybe detect coding errors. Well, this is things you know people do in practice, because you know this such a type of there are procedures where people write code and other people read over the code to try and spot you know things that are problematic or possible errors. So we could have programs doing this and, and learning to do this. We you know with deep learning methods. So we could detect you know dangerous things in code. Because usually when you know you write something but you don't check, you know, you do some checks before, you know, writing to memory and you might write outside of the, the area you've reserved, so this is a potential vulnerability, then th you can you know see that these checks have not been made. So there's also the type of things we could check for. More than that, you know, these type of techniques can give you support for writing code. You start writing and it can suggest what you should write next. Of course, this is not going to verify code, but it can help you know, produce more probably good quality code and at least uh, improve the efficiency of programming. You can also imagine annotating code, even with things like invariance, trying to learn you know, what invariance you can write in different you know, situations in the program. So, well, indeed, DARPA believes in this, and as we know in the past, DARPA has given us some you know, major progresses in, in computer science and you know, so this is potentially you know, an interesting area that will, is, is developing now and I think we should really look at you know, what this can bring to verification. Modeling the environment, well it's always a challenge and as I mentioned earlier, you know, highly non-deterministic models can be too general. Now, you can try and construct a model, you know, of the environment based on, on the physics of the environment and of, you know, all you, what you know about the environment, but this can be extremely, you know, cumbersome to manipulate. But you could say, well, I could also accumulate real data. Okay, imagine, you know, you want to, to verify codes operating in autonomous vehicles. Clearly a, a challenge these days. You could say, well, how do I model the environment? What can happen? 
lots of things that happen, but what can really happen? You know, what should I focus on? Well, if you have you know, vehicles equipped with all sorts of sensors running around, which we do have now, which is I'm just going to accumulate the data. And my model is going to be a data, a model based on the data. And this is you know, a new paradigm that's emerging in sciences, where we are, have been used in science to having you know, models based on, on uh, mathematics. And saying, well, you know, this is, we need to have simple rules to, to you know, describe what's going to happen. And of course, this is useful, and especially if you can compute with the, the mathematical representation. But an alternative is just to have you know, data saying what can happen. And you know, this is probably also an interesting area in which you could say, well, now my environment model, and of course, this you know, is in between verification and, and testing, because when you're looking at you know, data in which the system can operate, you're usually looking at test cases, then you can say, accumulate this data, probably you know, work with it to, to extract you know, the more meaningful features or, or learn from it in some ways to, to get the most meaningful scenarios, and then use this as my environment model. It's an interesting possibility. Monitoring software, that is, when I say operating, I mean software which is in operation, probably would be a better way to, to formulate it. Now, what's the idea there? Well, you know, in large systems, networks, I'm talking about computer networks, but it can also be electrical networks. For instance, an electrical network, you know, something can go wrong, because the, and the network can fall down. Because there's you know, some line which is overused, and then you know, a breaker goes off, and the whole thing starts collapsing. But in computer networks, we have similar things. Also in big, say, e-commerce sites or whatever, you know, you can, things can sometimes break down. But now, if you monitor what's going on, and you have lots of data you know, uh, going around, usually unusual patterns emerge before things really go wrong. So this is an idea, of course, this has been used in, in the past already. It's not you know, really new, but the fact that you can monitor the operation of a piece of software and then start to notice when something is going to go wrong and maybe learn from scenarios in which things go wrong. Of course, we're moving away from verification, but rather trying to you know, make our software more reliable, even if it's not you know, perfectly correct. But we can then observe what's going on and see when we hit a danger zone, try and steer the system towards a more safer world of operation, which is going to avoid at least a complete crash of the system. Maybe another option. So I think it's almost time for some conclusions. And uh, well, what are my conclusions? I've did you know, spend a few decades in my talk, and I think verification indeed has come a long way. And it's interesting that, that few computer science areas have attracted so much attention for so long. You know, in science, you know, things move from one topic to another fairly quickly, and if you look at you know, uh, things, and this, I'm talking about also about the things that were developed in the early uh, 80s, then these are still being used and, and people still you know, write papers about them, keep progressing and of course improving them. But maybe you know, beyond this progress, it's time for the next wave of big ideas in the field. And maybe learning could be something, I don't know, but it's a possibility. And I'm saying, well, you know, if all these companies are recruiting our researchers in in AI, you know, from my universities, where are the recruiters for verification people? I know that there are some around, and, and we have quite a few colleagues working in industry, but not at all the same level of excitement, and probably because we don't have yet have, you know, the possibility of, you know, doing really amazing things with verification. And I hope that someday, maybe in the next decade, we have the ideas which will let us do really amazing things. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. We can take a few questions, I hope. Uh, Jan Friesel. Je
So I hear you speaking about we can did not do amazing things in the verification world. Um, this slightly upsets me because I think we did do a number of amazing things. For instance, just to mention one, there will be another lecture, I think, during SPIN, is that we managed to get the CERN experiments running. So um, they had, at CERN, they have uh, big detectors, mm -hmm. uh, 60,000 parallel state machines. They use the notion of a state machine there, and they control monitoring all the experiments. These had problems using formal techniques, as developed in this community, we were able to deal uh, with, uh, with uh, making that possible. They could remove all the errors. I do not have to speak about lots of other, say, amazing things. So uh, mo the Mars lander is probably an example where uh, this really made a difference. And I think we are silently make lots of difference in the actual world. Okay, well, uh, indeed, I mean, I say we have come a long way, so, so I was, maybe was trying to be a little bit provocative by saying, you know, what are the really amazing things, and indeed uh, there are a lot of successes, as the ones you mentioned, in using formal verification techniques. Um, probably what's that happened is, you know, a very widespread impact. I mean, we are in a situation where, indeed, in, you know, very specific applications, which are, you know, uh, <coughs> justify, you know, a fair amount of investment, uh, we can do this type of things. Now, I know that, for instance, uh, you know, lots of, of companies are using verification in practice, but it's still a rather niche uh, area and limited to, you know, rather, I would say, uh, typical specific classes of applications. So, I don't want to be sound too negative about the field, but I want to be provocative to say, you know, we can go further, even though we've come the wrong way. Other questions? Yes. Well, th thanks for the interesting uh, overview. I think that's very useful. Um, just from my own experience, I, I think one of the sources of inspiration is um, practice, looking at what actually mm -hmm. developers do. And I, I've seen that sort of as an orthogonal um, story in, 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 in the points you mentioned. Um, very specifically, um, I've, been, I've been looking at, at um, what developers are doing, what, what technologies they are using, what tools they're using. and. Um, uh, I noticed that that things that seem to be hot in testing um, uh, are not mentioned or discussed at all at conferences like these. Mm -hmm. So there's um, there's this thing called JMOC, uh, which is a, a framework for um, for creating uh, test fakes or mocks or stubs, whatever you call them, mm -hmm. uh, in testing. Um, for, specifically for Java, there's a Google variant which is for C++. Mm -hmm. um, and if you actually look at what's going on there, um, it, it is not just producing uh, stubs, but actually inside the stubs you can specify pretty much temporal properties of the behavior you expect from your component under mm -hmm. test. Um, so that, that, that links very closely to the kind of things we're doing here with temporal logic and, mm -hmm. and, and things, uh, be it in a slightly more limited form. Um, on the other hand, there's something uh, going on, behave testing, which I think is mostly a Python uh, development, but also, also there um, I, I see uh, these ideas um, finding their way into practice of specifying the behavior you expect not only in terms of, you know, if I send this input value, I get that output value, but also um, I first call this uh, method and then call that method, and I expect the result to be dependent on the order in which I call things, for example. So it, 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 it reminds me a lot of things we're doing here, you know, in terms of temporal logic and, and, and um, sequentiality of things. But I uh, personally, I find that there's insufficient awareness of, uh, in this community of what's going on there and um, uh, initiatives to link what we are doing 
to the actual practice uh, of what's, what the actual developers are, are doing mm -hmm. and using. So that's my personal uh, point of view here. No, I, I can only agree with that. I mean, we need sources of inspiration and then in looking outside of the, the, the narrow area itself. And, and of course, the people doing things in practice have the real questions that you know, need to be answered. And so this can be an inspiration. And the way they try to solve them can also be an inspiration, clearly. Okay, in view of time, I suggest that we take uh, other questions uh, offline. Let's thank Pierre again. For thank you. I would like to give you this poster. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.